Das ist der Kodenbeweis. Thank you for coming. And I want to welcome you all. Um, I didn't expect quite a turnout. I expected, we thought we might have to go and bother the, the rugby union ground. <laughs> but anyway, but I wish to welcome you all tonight. And I'm actually overwhelmed by the response for just a week ago. It was in the Daily Dispatch. And also the, the numerous calls and emails I've received. And, and people just contributing on the phone. And hopefully I wrote it down correctly, but if it's just, you just have to see what happens. But I never knew there would be such a tremendous turnout and, and tonight. But thank you for coming. But first of all, before I start, there will be time of that I will do the, I, would, I will start off, um, then I will show you some slides, then I will talk again, show you some more slides. You must understand there's about 40, 50 slides there. So, and then, and then hopefully, and then I'll, I'll read other, other people that have written to me and telling them of what they experienced as well. But I want to thank people, certain people and organizations who have assisted in preparing for this evening. You will see on the, the notice well, the boards there is some of the extracts from the Daily Dispatch which I actually got from the, the, the um, public library in East London and I made copies of them and then of course around the back as well and that's, that's basically Glenn Hartwig's work. She, I just phone her up and ask her, I want this, she goes and finds it for me, that's all. And also to Glennis of the Daily Dispatch for sourcing some of the Daily Dispatch uh, pages. You will see that also part of the slides. To George Mountjoy for his photographs, which are actually colour, which I've included into the presentation. And then also to all the people who phoned me and gave me some information, etc., etc. But for, most of all, I want to thank my committee for their support for their help and for also gain a little bit of extra mile for this evening. I just hope that we have enough tea and coffee and cups outside there. <laughs> as, as William said, we are trying to record this evening because we know you have a story to tell. As I wasn't here around in this time, so I have no idea. So if when you try and when you when you want to talk, just if you can just introduce yourself. My name is Joe Soap or whatever. I hope as we listen and learn from each other tonight, we can relive the moments of our own memories. We must understand that history is alive. It's alive in the stories of the people. And this flood, and I'm no expert on the floods of East London, was according to the water volume that fell and the destruction it caused was one of the worst ever experienced by the city. And I'm talking about from what we know. I don't know what has happened. Apparently it was one in 1905 or something. Like that. Twelve people lost their lives. Some of those were on duty, helping others, protecting others. So before we even begin that, I just want to ask you to all stand in memory of those 12 people, if you can do that tonight. Thank you.
Thank you. The Islamic community gathered round and helped, and that spirit has never left. It is still the same today as it was 48 years ago. The community still helps others in need. On the 24th of August 1970, light drizzle began to fall. And that soon intensified, and soon East London was awashed, or washed with heavy downpours of rain. And various areas were heavily affected. And some of these communities were Buffalo Flats, Duncan Village, the North End, Torquay Road along the Nahoon River, Abbotsford, Beacon Bay, Dever Avenue, Marina Glen. And tonight we view and listen to those stories of those who experienced this. And these are your survival stories, your personal stories. And I just hope that you're able to just recount the personal drama, the family situations that you found yourself in, where you were, and how did you get out? How did you feel? Now the first photo, I have to go here yeah, and do this, come back. Bridal Drift Dam. Is it, it was constructed in 1969 and then renovated in 1994. But it was actually opened a few weeks after the construction had finished. And I will start with a recall by Mr. Graham Keepy of the chief, the chief enge city engineer at that time, who is now retired and he lives in Parklands, and I interviewed him on the 28th of June 2018, and he relates the following, and I'm going to read this to you. The Bridal Drift Dam was completed in 1969, and the Minister of Water Affairs opened the dam in early August 1970. Now, my dates are not 100% correct, because I haven't gone into a full research um, cycle. And he said that, this chap said that the, he hopes that the dam will be a benefit to all and that good rains will fall soon. <laughs> right. But you must also understand, this was, this was actually, well, I'm under correction, but the, there was a drought at that time. And this, the good rains fell. Two weeks later, after some good rains, the dam was 25% full on Monday. On Thursday, that's the 27th of the 7th, if I, if I remember, of the 8th, sorry. On Thursday at 8 o'clock, the dam was 35% full and rising. 15 inches of rain fell, of which 6 inches fell in one hour. <coughs> this is all that he's telling me. At noon, the dam was very full and overflowing. So I'm giving you some sort of insight. By Friday, that's at, at 20, 20 hundred hours, that's at 8 o'clock at night time, there was still 21 feet flowing over the side spillway. Now, I'm not sure where the side spillway is in that thing because I can't... Always on the right-hand side of that picture. Yeah. Okay, all right. So it was flowing over the spillway. At that time, they didn't have radios. So it was confusion. At the upper land, 
length dam, there was six feet, 16 feet coming over the spillway, which is designed to take, a ten, uh, designed to take 10 feet. So communications with the caretaker at the dams was limited. Radios had to be obtained from the, from the um, army. And fortunately, the Lang Dam's foundations were good and they stood. But water was up to the top of the handrails of the dam. So this is now the, that's the story of this situation. Now somehow, a policeman heard, now I don't know why it's a policeman, it could be anybody, but the policeman heard that the dam was overflowing. And he had this idea of this water coming down the river. Rather over the crest of the dam, but not over the spillways. He created a panic. He raised the alarm. The power station in the port was shut down. And then it lights out for several hours. Not like just last night. And Graham says that in town, the bridge over the Nahoon River, which was built by Vikernus developers, broke its, broke its back as one of the piers subsided, rendering the bridge impossible for vehicle traffic. And it was subsequently found that the damaged pier had, been, had not been founded on solid rock, but on a very large boulder, which had shifted when the water came down. So the causeway, the Abbotsford causeway was also flooded with the result that some of the residents of Abbotsford could not get home for a week. And in due course, an army Bailey bridge was brought in to span the sunken portion of the bridge and motorists used the bridge for over a year until the new one was built. I think that was the, the, the Batten Bridge. And he says here yeah, also that Turkey Road was flooded twice. Once by the water flowing into the river and secondly by the rising water levels in the river itself. And the water level was up to, to roof level. And this has been described as one in 200 year flood. So we've got another 170 odd no, 150 something years to go. But of course, there was other, in the next few years, there was other smaller floods that took place as well. But these floods, as well as the floods in Transvaal, necessitated a national review of the standards for the design of waterways, of bridges, and culverts. So they had to now look at the whole situation and see what the thing is. And and finally, Graham says that one thing is certain that the floods will never be forgotten by elderly residents who had been around in 1970-71. So that's his encounter of what um, the other person that also contributed extensively and I want to just go show you a photograph
There's another color photograph that George has of even that. It shows you how bad it is. Of course, this is the, that there. Uh, that's the Smarty Train rail line. There's a notice board there. And this is a parking sign there. The other person that, that contributed, and she's sorry that she can't be here tonight. She phoned me up and she said, wished us all well. Yes, be Kemp. And she's given me an account of what happened to them. And um, I'm not going to go through it all. It's quite <coughs> extensive, but she says that they bought in 1969 a 171 old trans at house. And you made extensive alterations, bought a swimming pool, bought canoes and a hobby cat, and loved every minute of living on the Nahoon River. And of course, in 1970, they were experiencing a bad drought. And on the 24th of August, light rain started. The following day, it broke furiously at, at 2.40 p.m., intensified and gusts of up to 50 miles per hour accompanied by hail fell. And about 80 millimeters fell in two hours. By 27th of August, 350 millimetres of rain had flooded the city, and it rained solidly until the next morning on the 28th. And they woke up on the morning of August 28th and noticed that the river was coming down fast with dark brown swells. And she urged her husband, Mossy, to drop the children at school, Mandolin at Clarendon and Leon and George at, at, sorry, Leon and Colin at Selborne and asked them to return as soon as possible as they, she was sure they were going to have a flood. And she found a removal van to come and collect the furniture. But they never arrived because they couldn't get through. <laughs> a traffic officer arrived at approximately 9 o'clock to warn that the river was in flood and to evacuate and to move to high ground. So she got her mother-in-law, who was semi-invalid, in a car, and managed to pack some of her clothes as medication into a small case, got the ID documents, some jewelry, and three squash trophies. <laughs> <laughs> this is what she said. Huh? <laughs> but, but can I ask you something? What would you take when you have to leave fast? <laughs> Morsi got the daughter, Lynette, who was in the room studying to his car, then drove his car to high ground on the main road, and, and she followed. The water was ready up to the wheels, and she parked behind Morsi, the brakes failed, and she bumped into his, into his car. And driving through the water must have been the cause of the brakes failing because the cars were brand new. So we, they waded back, one of the canoes came Drifting past, we put our animals on the canoe, and with Ivy, our domestic, holding onto the side of the canoe, the traffic officer pulled the boat, and me swimming and pushing at the back, we got the boat to our cars. The water had really risen to alarming heights. And Morsi and a couple of neighbors tried to get some of the antique furniture to the front door in case of the removal van arriving, but that was useless. <laughs> We had to get out of the area fast. So the traffic officer told me to drive up Old Trans Car Road. It was like driving into a solid stream. And I managed to get to the road up as far as Deborah Avenue, We are turned up. I was hoping to get to a friend's house in St. Andrew's Road in Selborne, but at the corner of Deborah Avenue and Chamberlain, there was a deep dam of water, and I couldn't get through. So I turned back and he remembered that Terry and Val Bryslin had a house leading off Dever Avenue. And they opened their, their arms and their home to them. 
and I was soaking wet and I had no other clothes. So Terry lent him some of, she lent me some of his clothes and my mother-in-law was in quite a state and was calmed down. I had no idea where my husband and Nanette were. The children at school had no idea what had happened to our home and family when they had to be fetched from school. I have forgotten how we eventually contacted our friends, the Kinnons or the Quinnons in Selborne, to ask them to fetch the children from school. When the roads were possible, I drove to St Andrew's Road in Selborne and they made them very welcome. A few hours later, my husband phoned to, to tell that they were safe. Apparently, Mossy and Lynette were the last persons to cross the Jack Batten Bridge before it partly collapsed. Abbotsford Bridge and Jack Batten Bridge were severely damaged with the result that people from, Bay, from Beacon Bay had to look for alternative routes to the city. And once we were safe and sound in our friend's house, we realized how blessed we were that the flood happened during daylight and not during night time. And as soon as we can get, as soon as we could, we went to see the devastation of our old house. Mud, broken windows, most of our furniture swept away, collapsed ceilings, all clothes in the cupboards full of mud, a lovely smell, dead fish, even snakes in the mud, a broken piano, a photograph of it there somewhere, landing at play, at play waters, and then to crown it all, like every, every disaster, you always get those opportunists, people, strangers are digging in the mud, inside and outside our home, looking for mementos. And I think she captures the spirit of East London in, in this thing. She says, old friends and new friends, the city council, the traffic department were fantastic. The family, the Quillen and the Vassen families were amazing. And to crown it all, there was one chap by the name of Eric Goodwin, Godwin, sorry, offered us his beautiful home in Batty Road. Fully furnished, we only needed to take our personal items. So what generosity. And as soon as the insurance company gave us the go-ahead, I hired a couple of workers and started the job of digging the mud out of the house. The house was built with cavity walls. So we knocked all air bricks out to get the air to circulate and to speed up the drying of the walls. And most ceilings had caved in, cupboards all broken, light fitness damaged, our clothes full of mud and stained. Somehow, the f wooden floors were still in perfect condition. And then she ends up by saying this, throughout all the drama and heartache, our flag kept on flying in the breeze. <laughs> what, what, what marvelous story to tell there. Uh, I'm going to talk some more, some more slides.
Our next story, I hope you all are still awake. <laughs> it, it could go until midnight for all I know. <laughs> the next one is from, it's an email from Flick Wilmore. She calls herself Flick Wilmore, that was her, but she calls herself also AKA. And Joseph. She's from Amanus. She was in Senate 9 in Claverdon. They lived in Beacon Bay where her mother, Edith Joseph, had started Flingwin's nursery school. And they were in number 15 Yorkist Drive. And the property apparently bordered the, the ravine going down to the river. And, and apparently was used as a communications point. She doesn't remember much about the scale of the floods, but what I do remember is that I was told that I would not be able to go home after school since Batten Bridge had collapsed. So she went home with Mrs. George, the school secretary, and she took two of us with her. There was no phone contact. She stayed and she was remembering that she was, that the sensors were taken to Beacon Bay, Bonza Bay by helicopter, so it was a fairly all along the line. She stayed with the school friend until the Bailey Bridge was completed and then she was able to cross the bridge, clinging to the young man from the army, his arm. My father was away in business, and so my mother was at home alone. She was an amazing woman, and somehow she got through the ordeal. Her letters, which you might find interesting, tell a much more dramatic and a very personal story. And she managed to extract some information from her mother's diaries, and she's given it to me. And this is one of the amazing things about this, and I call this the mother's anxiousness time. Her husband's not there, her children are not there, she's alone at home. How would we cope? Anybody, how would anybody cope? With all these disasters around you, you can't get anywhere. And I just read some of the stuff, and some of the stuff is quite involved. On the 27th of August, she writes, at 11.15, I find it hard to cope with them as the rain is teeming down. She was still at the space school, there are kids with her, and this rain is coming down. She can't cope with them, she can't let them go outside because it's raining. Our water, our garden is underwater, in many places. The Hoon River is very high on Wednesday. I heard earlier that that lovely house down near the, down near the bridge was up to its windows, and later that just the chimney was sticking out. And the old couple who owned it, sitting on their little wooden pier fishing, 
I often wondered about them. Always flying the South African flag. Who are they? I'm sure it was a dream house for them, and they did enjoy it for a brief little spell. Then she heard that Batten Bridge had gone, and still it rained. I just fed them when Mrs. Wood came in. There's some of the kids at the school came in in great distress. She'd been obliged to abandon her lovely home down in the valley. On Wednesday, she had told me that water had cascaded down the slope at a frightening rate and it penetrated her home. She, was, she had a super lounge with a white shaggy carpet which is, which is not only ruined but smells. Today, she says that great boulders came down and crushed against a back wall, smashing it in. She just took a case, a case of things and a dog and left. And her husband is on the other side of the river. And then this lady, I don't know how old she was then, I must have found out. She got into her shorts, put my warm jersey and my raincoat and got the spade out and opened up the drains we made a few years ago. So the water, and I made a few more little drains for the garden. And in a matter of minutes, all the topsoil was sailing down onto the neighbors below. <laughs> well, it's one way to get rid of the water. She realizes that Anne and her daughter couldn't get through, but I wasn't worried. She had fed with several fins in the area, but I was anxious. I would have liked her to be with me to share the, the adventure. And then, of course, people were coming via Kai Road going round, and, and some of them came back in on, on, on that route. On Friday, it was still raining, but less, with less force. My thoughts are with you three my dad in PE, my sister Sue in Grahamstown. And me with the, and that's, that's Anne, she's talking about her daughter with the fun winners. I'm going back to bed to read the other seven library books. <laughs> <laughs> no TV. That was before TV too. All cell phones. Dear God, what of the people in the valley in, the valley in Toiko Road and all the African and colored folks, for it will take start walls and a strong roof to keep out this rain. When clothes and blankets are wet, what then? As soon as I can, I must send a donation to the relief fund. Thank God we bought a house on the hill. I must open it up today to people who may be in trouble. That's her account. There's lots more, but I need to move on. I worked in the port, but I don't, I don't recall that. There is a faint outline of a ship at the back there. Of a vessel. I'm not 100% sure on this, what, what that is. That was a gate to the power station. Sorry? A gate into the power station. So this would be on the West Bank? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then that will be either odd extension, etc. That would be a key site. It looks like a shed there. Thanks for that. Before I get on to the next one, I'll show you more.
I got a phone call a few days ago from Richie Morris and he records, he's actually from um, at the moment staying in Sedgefield and he gave me uh, some of his his story and he's called it the Lions State Operational. And it gives you a different account of what happened to them. His parents were John and Joan Morris at the time of the flood, and they lived at 11 Indre Road in Beacon Bay. There was about the fifth house built in the then Beaconhurst, originally East London North Township. And it's commenced in 1958. I was born in 19... He was born in 1959, and he lived in that house in Indre Road for 13 years. And at the time of the 1970 floods, there was the Beaconhurst Tennis Club over the road from us, and a practice wall with concrete paved areas on either side of the wall. And then there was open fields where the primary school was, And uh, it was at, at uh, De La Salle, I hope I've pronounced it right, college at the time that the bridge went down and his mother came to, fe to collect me. And they were unable to get back. And they spent a night at their friend who lived in Willisdale Road, that was John Bryce, next to Robin and Jenny Hobbs and Des Baycock on the other side of the, of the road. And they had a perfect view of Batten Bridge and its collapsed state. The next day they were able to walk over the broken subsiding bridge, which was covered with masses of twigs and other debris. And as a youngster of 12 at the time, this was all exciting. It's a big adventure. Even better than going on holiday. And in arriving at home, we found that our telephone was still working. 88721 was the number. But she, and he also understands that that hours and, and one other phone in Beacon Bay will remain working for the whole duration of the floods. And Dad, who had been at Beacon Bay Village Management Board involved with community issues, and when the phone was working, they formed an important communication line for rescue and relief issues. And the Beacon Bay Municipality established temporary offices in our lounge and dining area. The double garage became a storeroom for relief supplies. And the military helicopters used the field over the road from us, where the, military, where the primary school is now located, as their landing and local base. So for several weeks, the house was transformed into a 24-7 operational beehive. Mom, his mother with the ladies' force, formed the workers and were constantly cooking up soups and meals 
for those who have been stranded and needed support. Once the temporary Bailey Bridge had been rebuilt, we returned to school. I don't think they enjoyed that. As a youngster, there was an important lesson learned, and that is community co cooperation and teamwork can overcome any obstacle. I don't remember what the telephone bill was, but I do remember that the municipality wrote a thank you letter to the folks and paid some expenses.
just one or two other uh, stories to tell from the people that have sent me or phoned me. Um, Ivan and Isma Engelbeck, he phoned me to say he related to me how he could not get through to Nuhun because of the rising waters and he was taking his four children to school and he had to travel by King Williamstown. So imagine that took an hour and a half to 45 minutes longer than normal. So He's, he was on the, on the land somewhere in, in, in um, I think it's in Wallace, he's towards... He's in Ravens of Avenue, he's next to Ravens of Avenue, he's just up, 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 up of the um, okay. stream of, or up hill from Oxford Road, near the Batting Bridge. Okay. Thank you. His farmland was covered, he says, he's in sand, and the pump he had could not be used after the flood. And then another lady, I'm not sure on her name, on, on her surname, she phoned to say that her brother, Val Thompson, was one of those who lost his life. He and a colleague, Mr. Foot, Mr. Foot, was on a harbour launch that was swept out by the stormwater at Nahoon. And he lost his life. And then, of course, another gentleman by the name of Mr. Van der Bos, he found to say that he caused rain to the houses with his canoe. Um, that's what I've got at the moment. I'm just going to show you some more photographs, and then I'm going to open it up to you.
first lot of Persian whiskey. That would be great, the, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other person? Well, I can tell you something. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm Joan Barrow, and we lived in the house right opposite the tennis court okay. at uh, Beaconhurst. Place the people so they can see <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we lived right opposite the tennis courts in the house there. And what happened actually was the we had very high tides that came in. Why well, our house, we had the distinction of being the only house in Beacon Bay that was flooded to shoulder height. And what happened was that the river, this uh, tides came in very fast. And when the bridge, more or less, broke, everything had built in, the water just came straight through and into the club, you know, and that level, and then went into our house. And we'd been in our house for five months. Yeah, we actually moved in on Friday the 13th, <laughs> and, uh, and my husband had the bright idea of calling it Driftwood. <laughs> Five months later it was. Yeah. I was actually in Japan. I'd left on the we it, the rain started on the Monday. By the Wednesday, the Mount Mrs. Douglas and Assy Malcolm was lived in Torquay Road, they and my mother had planned a trip to Japan. My father had died the year before, so my mother asked me to go. She didn't want to go as a threesome. So the family all said, yeah, I do, go. So, so I went. But we got to the airport on Wednesday, because our, our trip was from Johannesburg on this Thursday. And Wednesday, there were no flights, but we were out at the airport. And we had a private plane standing by in case the ceiling was high enough to take off. And um, Douglas, Mar he, uh, he was Malcolmus, so he had a car standing by in case we had to go all the way to Johannesburg by car to get onto our plane the next morning. Um, anyway, get to four o'clock, and Rusty Russell, who was the pilot, said, okay, there's a 400-foot ceiling, whatever it is. If you come now, you can go. 
So we got on the plane. It was freezing, freezing cold. I was sitting right in the back with the luggage. And when we went over the Matopos and that, they warned us. You could hear on the radio, watch out for ice on the wings, which was very exciting. And then when we got just outside Johannesburg, everything was marvelous. It was as clear as anything. So I thought, that's great. You know, the rains have gone now. Everything's fine. So we set off to Japan. We got to Tokyo. And the next day, um, Douglas and Assie got this telegram from their daughter, young Assie saying, terrible floods, talky road, your house underwater, fish in the lounge. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so Douglas said to Assie, oh, I must go home. And she said, rubbish, you'll just be in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, well, I mean, and then we were sympathizing, my mother and me, because we hadn't heard anything about it. And three days later, I don't know, two days later, we were in, I don't know, somewhere else in, in Japan, and I got a telegram from my husband saying, house flooded, <laughs> don't come home. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, when we, my dog, we had a Labrador, and he just took off up the hill and went and installed himself with a family oh. that had dogs and stayed there for three days. <laughs> and um, my husband had to go via King Williamstown or wherever it was to get home. And this house at 25, you, you know, was absolutely flooded. The, which was on its side. I had prepared 24 meals for the days I was going to be away. <laughs> and they were all you know, in the flood. And everything, when we moved, he moved out to my mother's house in Torquay Road, I mean, Sheerness Road, up on the hill. And she had left her little dog with my husband, little Skippy. And when my husband got back, the Skippy was floating on the table. <laughs> anyway, we then moved out. And it took until the following April to, for the walls to dry out, and we had to rebuild. We had to replace all the cupboards, everything. But the one lucky thing was that we did have a, like, a room upstairs, which was the kids' playroom, and I had put my photographs there. Everything else was, but all our books and everything were flooded. And this was the only one that I managed to rescue. It's covered in, you know, um, a -A oh, yeah, A A L. Yeah. It's still got all the things of the water, so and it was it was the Christopher Robin book, oh. and which my children had given to my children. But it was actually mine when I was a little girl. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my story. <laughs>
Another one is the actual dispatch from the 1970 flights. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's all there. And it's all going to be kept at the top of the historical village. Thank you for the same. Thank you. People, you're welcome to look there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the amazing things that I saw when I was looking at those daily dispatches, it's five cents. <laughs> One name that should actually receive special mention was a contractor who was here in East London at the time, and before the Bailey Bridge was put in place, a gent by the name of Laurie Fossati, free of charge, brought his equipment and rebuilt the approaches to the Abbotsford Causeway so that there was an access route to East London. Thank you. He actually, as far as I know, is now a resident of Kennedy Park. His daughter Cheryl lives in Bogsa Bay. Thank you for that. Any other stories? My late dad, when we uh, were opening Connell Cabin's here at the museum, so I saw all that water in this ground. And my late dad was at the power station, and he was booked off sick that week. Never ever got sick, never ever went to a doctor, but he got bronchitis and he was booked off. And because we lived in this area, we were always the last to have lights switched off if there was an emergency, because of the Freer Hospital. And our lights went out and Dad said, uh oh, something's wrong. And he got out his jersey and his rain back and an umbrella, <coughs> said goodbye to us all and went off to, it was on the Friday evening, down to the power station. And he said when he got there, there wasn't a soul in the power station area, the harbour area. Customs were missing, there were no cars, it was absolutely desolate in there. And he went into the power station with a torch through those gates that we saw. Went in and the turbines were still warm, so they'd been switched off not too long ago. Switched one of them on, which was our area, because our lights came on first. <laughs> and then he decided to go up the hill to the, I think it's the old Oceanic Hotel, mm -hmm. to find all the guys in the pub drinking. Oh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's how our lights all came on later on that night. Oh, oh. And then my other little story was that I was at the Sacred is now Hudson Primary and on that Friday we got a message from the principal to say we need to evacuate because there was a wall in the basement that had fallen over and she couldn't find the buses to come and fetch all the kids so we had to find our own way home. I swam in Deborah Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> the circle is that river that flows through the think it goes down to Blind River. We had to swim across there and my mother was furious with me because I got my suit suitcase wet. <laughs>
somebody mentioned the caravan, uh, I'll, never, I'll never forget that because that caravan belonged to my dad's brother that used to work on the railway <laughs> as a station master. And for all this, we waded through that other little bridge um, and in water, and mom still said, Hey, there's somebody's caravan. <laughs> but my uncle had parked the caravan because he was a little bit of he parked it in front of the house. And when we got the mom said, But where's the ex caravan? <laughs>
evening and people could contribute largely doing the photographs and whatever. And I remember vividly when you showed those movies how you physically saw the water rising from the Loon River as it, as it was uh, coming down.
I got to the top of Oxford Street to go into Cambridge. There was a traffic officer and said, sorry, you can't go way around out here. And I was living at that time with, at what was called Wilsonia. I had to go all the way around through Melinda on the gravel road. That's <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
subsided. <laughs> we said, how we wish that this could happen frequently. <laughs> and that also God has brought Father Christmas to us. Because in the rivers, we could get these pianos. We could get a lot of things. Also, uh, we, don't know how, we didn't know how to fish. I was 12 years then. Yeah. We didn't know how to fish, but God brought fish on our doorstep. <laughs> we saw big fish, big fishes, big fishes which we could not use the rod or whatever, which we could just get into the river, shallow as it was, then we can catch. Then we caught fish and we ate fish the whole what you call two weeks, two week period. <laughs> Nevertheless, that was Christmas. But on the other hand, remember on that, on those days, there was a, a down village was caught by forced removals. Mm. The forced removal moving people from Dangan village to Spunza, I mean to Tanzania. Mm. Also, we had uh, Indians, Indian area, which is North End which was predominantly Indians. They were selling food, they had businesses, they had houses in there. They were also highly or heavily, highly affected. They were highly affected and uh, also on our side, remember, our houses were made of wood and iron. So they were easily swept out away, I mean away. And a lot of people died, but that was never reported. All what I'm saying is that my request to you, first of all, many people died. There are no more. Talk about white friends. Yeah. On our side, people died. There are no more. People that have got through history of what actually happened. You know? So uh, it would be wise, therefore, to document. And I would love to know what from here, where to. Yeah. Because it would love, we would love this history to be documented. Either a film made, yeah. a book written, or you need to have archives. So that's my advice. But all in all, uh, there are outstanding stories. Yes. A certain guy from, that's what I heard, a certain guy from North End, there was a butchery, and it was, there was, there was, it was Christmas to us. <laughs> yeah? So um, the, he tried to catch a, a kettle leg. Yeah? <laughs> with its hook, which was, he thought, that was his Christmas, but he was swept away. And that guy died. So we had in all shops in town, uh, you know, clothes were just swept away, and our people picked, picked, because it was Christmas to us. So what I'm saying is that we prayed that how we wish that God can bring this rain again. Because we, we, so that's the story, but nevertheless, I would love us to, if you can organize the same session where it could be a, a sharing session that is between this end and this end, mm -hmm. you'll get outstanding stories. Yeah. Even God's coffins were exhumed, yeah. you know, this rain exhumed coffins, we could see coffins clear, yeah. but it was, it was, it was horrific. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.
SAP at that time, and he was the link for the radios when there were no telephones. So we take our hats off to Donald Clark. If there's any, if there's no other stories. Okay. Here we end. Owen and then Mary also Owen. manager in Buffalo City and uh, I've got quite a bit of information that we've gathered over the, the years but I've heard some absolutely fascinating stories. I agree with Coco at the back there. We need to document whatever we can yeah. and there are many people that were in those floods that we've lost information so we need to, whenever something happens, we need to document it. Today, we have photographs taken with Instagram and what have you, and we're able to record this. So there's a lot more records that are coming out. But if anybody has got anything, um, I'm at 043-743-7118. Um, that's the disaster management. It's in the phone book. If you've got anything you can share with us, we'd gladly added to our archives as well and uh, we'd love to hear from you as well, thank you um, I was 12 years old, we lived in Cambridge uh, just up front, well, between the high and the primary school in Croydon Road and when the power station shut down that night everything was pitch dark and I think they released the boilers because you could hear this terrible hissing sound for about an hour um, and nobody knew what was going on. You just heard this hissing noise and it was pitch, pitch dark. Thank you. I wasn't here. But I know that it's now quarter past nine. I can go and we could probably could sit down for the next three, four hours. But those that want to leave can leave. But there's also tea available for anybody else who wants tea or something like that. Um, if there is any more stories, then maybe you can write it down for us and send it to us by email. Um, our board historical email address is, if I'm under correction, William, it's border.historical.society, right? At gmail.com. Okay. So if you've got anything, but we do need to close the session because you can't, you can't carry on all night, though, even though we would love to. But, but I thank you for coming, I thank you for sharing, and I thank you for listening and, and to the bunch of more people of the And thank you for all your Yes, thank you. Thank you.